previous talks, so this kind of follows uh, was kind of nicely, I think. So uh, very good talks. Um, yeah, so I want to pick up on on uh, what David and uh, Bruce presented yesterday. So these are, you know, the the the, the theory about or their theory about how uh, life originated. So we had this um, uh, this scenario here. Oh, that could could be a scenario. So you have the uh, uh, you know the creation of the uh, the relevant molecules and the accumulation and concentration in pools here. And then you would have what is kind of important here, a wet bicycle, cycle. But not just a wet bicycle, cycle, but also a hot wet bicycle. cycle. And then in principle, this could, you know, start and Darwinian evolution. So, so this is kind of key to this, this understanding is that this, this thing here is a cyclist that you have continued testing of your, your entities and those testing can then at some point, you know, be governed by Darwinian evolution. And then at some point something Kind of a life could come from that, so that that's the idea. And then you end up uh, with an export of, of of life here. So what this actually also kind of covers is the the gap between you know the molecules. So that was uh, some previous talk you talked about. You know, a, a lot of people have talked about. You know, we had this set up the, the the kind of the bricks for for life. But you know, what happens from from the starting point until you reach uh, uh, you know Luca? No one really knows. Right? So Luca here is, is uh, the last universal common ancestor, which is uh, actually an extremely complex organism in itself. Uh, it has something like 329 genes. So we're comparing it you know, to something that has to do with origin of life, I think is a little bit of a fast stretch. But anyway, we have this gap in between and uh, we don't know what's going on there. So we need to understand, but we can also see here, uh, this is, Lines here are uh, complexity of life. So we go from simple molecules, and then you should have an increase in complexity. The complexity also increase in size. So you would go from molecules and nanometer scale uh, to a micrometer scale. So this will kind of be a natural, you would imagine, logical evolution of life if it follows Darwinian evolution, uh, that is to say. So as, as the previous talk I talked about, we have the RNA world to probably start somewhere in between here. We don't know when. But that's probably likely that there was an RNA world before uh, we had Luca. And now I've kind of drawn this as a straight line. So you have increasing in complexity based on this. This is a statement up here. And then you just increase in size and so forth. But it's kind of likely that this is probably not what happened. So you would probably have something that goes like that. So I think this is, uh, for me at least, that's important to remember when I do this is that life didn't know that it has to become Luca right? Life didn't know that it has to develop uh, uh, these things, right? So the, the track of life until it reached Luca, we don't know, right? So all of this, we don't know, but it might have been wide branches. It could have been, you know, uh, an RNA DNA hybrid. It could be an RNA protein uh, hybrid at some point. So at some end point, we have, you know, it's, it's life as we know it, but we don't know what happened. Before this. So this is at least important for me. Uh, if you follow true Darwinian evolution. <clears throat> then I'm kind of touching on my background. I actually come from nanoscience. So I have a, an expertise in looking at very small things with microscopes. And so why I'm interested in, in origin of life. And that's because of this, you know, we'll go back to the origin. We probably also have to go back in complexity. We probably also have to go into, you know, smaller things. And this is uh, the nanoscale. So here you have a plot. So each division here is, is a, a decade or a, a decade. So you see, you go from 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 9. This is the nano. And then you have 10 to the minus 8. On, and then you have 100 uh, nanometers here. So that's the red bar here, the red arrows indicates where you have the nanoscale. You can also see here on the plot that we go from atoms that are typically at 10 to the minus 10. And then we go to where you, know, where you can begin to recognize structures that have something to do with life. So you have DNA. On, and protein simply two, three nanometers in size and so forth. And the, the smallest virus here, you see this uh, phase here, is typically three, three, four hundred uh, nanometers in size. So this actually means that this scale here is interesting. You go from some non-life to life on this scale. <laughs> and the tool that I use is uh, what's known as an atomic force microscopy. Mm -hmm. So this is a special kind of microscope where instead of using light to look with, so that's typically how you you need to have an optical microscope and you can see cells and so forth and in optical microscope. 
but but you are limited by how light behaves at a certain size. So light you can only use to something like 0.5 uh, microns. And if you have to go below that, you cannot use light in. And then you have to do like a blind man. You have to feel how the surface looks like. So this is actually what you do here. You have this very sharp probe. And then you're using this clever principle of a laser that is reflected on the backside of cantilever and a kind of a weight principle. So you can see small movements here are amplified on the wall over here, right? So even I'm moving my hand quite small, it, it amplifies on the wall. So that's actually the same principle here. And that principle is, is so that you can actually feel down to sub, uh, uh, sub atom distance between atoms level. So this means that you can actually see atoms on the surface. So this is what is shown here. So there's single atoms uh, rows sitting on the surface of a, of a microsurface. You can also see individual molecules. So here's a coronary special molecule, and this is an actual molecule that you can feel how it looks like in, in, in for this technique. So then I wanted to combine, you know, David and Bruce's theory with, you know, my tool and see what can we see when we go down to, to, to a very small scale. Can we actually try to see if we can see the first steps of life in the lab? using uh, Davis and Bruce uh, technique. So the, this, the experiment itself is actually uh, embarrassingly simple. So taking a, a cleaved mica surface, so mica has this special property that when you cleave it, you get an extremely clean surface and also flat. Um, and then using very clean water and then using some filtered, very clean solutions of the four nucleotides. And then just treating it for three wet dry cycles on a hot plate. Um, and the whole process takes about one and a half hour. And um, so what I'm going to show you now is, is what actually comes out of that kind of simple experiment. So then I took my very sharp probe and then I put it on this surface here. So the, the reason that it's round is that that's how it fits into the AFM. And then we have this kind of metal disc that you just put into the atomic force microscope. And this is actually what you see. Uh, so here we have the, the different uh, uh, base pairs. So we have a UND uracil here, we have a CVC uracil, and we have the GC and AC to get the, get the meaning. What well, you also see here, you see the see something that are polymer shaped here. So there are several micron long uh, polymer shaped single stranded uh, polymers here. In, in actually most cases, or actually all of the cases, we see these uh, long polymers. And uh, we did some uh, AFM imaging of normal RNA and RNA from biological sources as well, and they look exactly the same. So they're very similar to what we see here. And interestingly, we didn't only get these kind of very long uh, polymers here. We also, in some cases, see tiny rings. So this was uh, not every time, and it's only observed when we combine you know, uh, the ones that match. The two base pairs that match, so the AU or the CG, which it would be so. So in this case here, we have rings from AU. Uh, these two pictures here, and these two pictures here from from GC. So the arrows I indicate here actually indicate rings that are kind of stacked in size. So something could could suggest that these are actually you know several rings on top of each other. So you can imagine that you have one ring and then another ring lying on top of each other. So this is this is what is shown. And they're the same diameter and, and same size. Uh, and in some other cases, so this is another case where we also see these rings here. You can see these individual rings, but what they have, they have small things attached to them. So that's uh, kind of interesting as well, as well, because these rings here have, uh, have these uh, small extra uh, attachments uh, to them. And this was just by taking these, uh, these uh, uh, wet dry cycling uh, uh, so we could actually form a whole uh, um, yeah, kind of catalog of, of different rings that we saw. So you can see here, this is taking thousands and thousands of rings. So this would be, you know, the average size of that, uh, around 30 nanometers, so, but they would vary like this in size uh, for the CG rings. And for the AU rings, the average size was around 39. And there would be, you know, this would show the, the kind of scale that they would find in. You could also see them, you know, with different attachments and you can see rings that, come in uh, kind of pairs and they're coupled up to each other. So the interesting thing about rings is that it, it gets around this, this strand inhibition problem. So if you can imagine that you have a, an, an RNA ring, a string, and you need to template copy that, um, then at a certain length, you cannot 
by Brownian motion template copy yourself. You need some kind of agent to, to, to copy. So you cannot just uh, copy by self. But you get around that, but if you give a wrong ring that is small enough, then the, the it, it, it can actually detach from 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 from, uh, from you know the the, the template ring uh, by just Brownian motion. Um, so that that thing I think is is kind of interesting. So then I kind of when I tried to publish this, I got a lot of uh, pushback from uh, from reviewers because they said, "Oh yeah, you're just seeing what was already there. You're just seeing uh, you know contaminants. You see something there from the lab and so forth." So so I had to do a lot of control experiments. So the first control experiment is, of course, to look at you know what did I get if I just took the the, the simple dry up at room temperature, you know, um, uh, dry up of the solutions that are used, and, and here you get to see some of the stuff that I got here. So actually, what you see here is actually kind of interesting to the previous talk because here you see the the crystallization of the monomers here already on the surface. Uh, you also see something kind of stringy here that is not uh, that looks kind of a little bit similar to what we see, but what is uh, we'll get back to this in, in a later point. But in most cases, we just see something where you don't see polymers, and that's kind of important. I could also do the uh, where uh, I take the you know combinations like I did, so taking the combination and let them dry up, and again we see these crystalline uh, features. We also see some stringy stuff here that seems to be uh, connected. Uh, and then, of course, I could do uh, wet dry cycles, but then at room temperature, because one uh, assumption is that it needs to be at high temperature. That's also what the previous talk talked about. You need to increase the temperature to get the, the, the activation going, to get the, you know, the, the, the polarization going. Uh, so, so that's why we did try to do the wet dry cycles at room temperature to see if we picked up some material from, from uh, or the, you know, this was some contaminant or something. And again, we see these uh, these uh, crystal structures in, in some of the cases. Um, and then, of course, we did the, the hot wet dry cycle. So these are directly comparable. The only thing here is that this was done at room temperature. Otherwise, everything else was the same. So the solutions were the same. Uh, everything else was the same. But then we ended up having the the you know the polymers as a difference between between the one you saw before and the, this one. Uh, um, yeah, so getting back to this, so these irregular patches here, so I kind of uh, compared them here. So here you see these uh, these irregular stuff here, and here you see the polymers, and the polymers are constantly or uh, homogeneous in a way they are 0.5 to 1 nanometer thick, which is also what we find for RNA and DNA support. Uh, while these here are, are irregular and they're 0 0.1, 0 0.3 nanometer thick, which actually means that there are huge gaps between the monomers, so they cannot be linked. They cannot be polymerized. They're just hanging together by a simple uh, uh, hydrogen bond. So this is a hydrogen bonded structure, and it's kind of similar to the to the you know the other thing. So the this here um, part here, which is also hydrogen uh, uh, bonded structure, but that's a crystalline hydrogen bond. And interestingly, if you look at this here, the CG, you can actually see the remnants of these crystals here. So it seems like that the that the uh, that the, the polymers are growing out of these uh, these crystals. Okay. Um, yeah. So this also shows some of the uh, uh, we try to compare it with some some real uh, 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 real virus or real uh, biological material. And here you see uh, what is known as virus, which are, are small strands of of RNA that infects. Uh, uh, I think it's a potato plant or a, 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 a fruit trees uh, or fruits, and and it, it you know it's, it's actually the smallest kind of infectious agent that known to to, to nature. So these are the small uh, RNA strands that just can uh, can uh, can duplicate in, inside the uh, fruits. And actually, what they look very similar to what we see, and we can actually in some cases all capture these virus rings in in the air. So just to show us a comparison between uh, uh, what we've seen made in, in these uh, wet dry cycles to what we actually find in, in nature. Okay, so that kind of uh, concludes what I wanted to say. Uh, so of course, thanks to uh, to Sohan for giving me the opportunity to give this talk, and and also to Martin for, for giving this arranging this. Thank you very much.